Okay. Are you all able to see my slides? Wonderful. All right. So before we dive into the details of the plan, we really wanted to place this work into context and make sure that the public has a great understanding of why it makes sense to engage in development of a climate adaptation and resilience action plan across the city. Um, first off, we know based on existing work that climate risk is relatively high in Nashville and in our region as indicated by FEMA. Um, we also see the number of climate disasters in Tennessee increasing steadily, and that comes with increasing loss of life and property that amounts to $50 billion since 2010. We also know that climate events impact infrastructure systems and populations differently. So specific groups may be disproportionately impacted for a couple of reasons, but the two that we like to point out are because their exposure is more significant or because they have lesser access to resources to recover. And then we also have seen kind of a, a tipping point, I think, in 2023 for our society from a climate perspective. We've seen significant high wind events, thunderstorms, extreme heats, and that's just in Nashville alone. When we look across the world globally, there have been droughts that affect food supply, significant flooding, uncontrollable wire, wildfires, and the list goes on. So this is really um, a, a, an urgent issue that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and from a local government perspective as well, and a community perspective, if we want to put it bluntly, if we don't start thinking about adaptation and resilience, we're going to see the costs associated with climate events exponentially increase. One major way that we can measure resilience efforts is in terms of dollars invested in adaptation strategies. So examples of that in the case of flooding would be things like raising roadways, reinforcing bridge abutments, creating flood buffer zones. Um, and using nature-based solutions in high vulnerability areas. And so making more investments in those ad adaptation strategies relative to the cost of repairs after these events, we would hope to see um, sort of an, an inverse of that relationship. So we know that every dollar invested in resilience um, can um, essentially avoid up to six dollars in repair and recovery costs. And so if we continue on um, business as usual without making those investments, we are gonna see annual losses significantly increase. Another thing to note um, is that there's no such thing as a natural disaster. So we do have natural hazards and risks that exist, um, and those have been worsening as the climate warms. But disasters are really human made, and the reason why is because there are policies and decisions that we can make as humans that can reduce or create risk. And so um, that's an important mindset to keep as we move um, through this work and this adaptation plan. Uh, a little bit of context as to how we developed um, and moved through the adaptation planning process. Um, so this work was primarily completed over the spring and summer um, and was significantly informed by 11 different metro departments working together through a series of three workshops to develop two work products. We'll spend the bulk of our time today on the climate adaptation and resilience plan, but there's a companion um, product that we will also discuss briefly, and that's known as the Climate Resiliency Toolkit. So they are very related and interdependent work products, and that toolkit really helps to um, prop up and stand up and effectuate the work that we'll talk about in the climate um, adaptation and resilience plan. Um, we also have taken great care throughout the process to leverage existing work products and planning efforts that um, either directly address um, the concept of resilience or tangentially touch the concept of resilience. And so two examples are the multi-hazard mitigation plan that is um, maintained by our Office of Emergency Management, but also current performance management approaches, um, budget equity tools that have been used for diversity, equity, and inclusion processes, and then also the approach we use for building a capital improvements budget and plan. We also um, have focused on this work this summer um, due to our commitments within the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy. And what uh, GCOM, as it's known, um, it, its acronym, what it uh, requires local governments who sign on to do is take 
both climate uh, mitigation actions through development of a climate action plan. And uh, the Sustainability Advisory Committee here at Metro completed that climate action plan in 2021. But they also require within three years of signing on to that commitment development of a uh, adaptation plan. And so um, in our efforts to sign on uh, in, in um, the early years of the Cooper administration, the timing was ripe to actually transition um, and, and develop and work on a document that focused on um, climate, climate adaptation and resilience. Um, so a little bit more um, about the toolkit, and we'll go into more detail later today, um, is essentially a suite of resources and tools that will embed the concepts of equitable sustainability and resilience into department and agency strategic planning and budgeting processes. Um, so we very quickly realized that um, in order to really see change from an adaptation and resilience perspective, we needed to embed and ingrain um, those concepts into the work that Metro departments do. And so this toolkit is really designed to be responsive to multiple levels of Metro departments. Um, staff and needs um, and responsibilities um, and really allow them to customize their approach um, surrounding these core concepts um, that we've developed. So we'll, we'll share more information specifically about that climate resilience toolkit at the end of our presentation. So what did the adaptation planning process look like? There are a couple of key steps that are summarized on uh, this slide here. Um, so first, assessing Metro's climate risks, conducting a vulnerability assessment, evaluating adaptive capacity, identifying and prioritizing adaptation strategies, and then finally developing tools to support implementation. And so, um, as noted before, we worked very, very closely with Metro departments um, and through review of um, best practices and technical review with um, U.S. housing um, and urban development, but also um, ICLE local government sustainability to make sure that we were moving through an adaptation planning process that does represent best practice. And so now we'll talk through each of those uh, steps in further detail. So first, when it came to assessing Metro's climate risks, um, we relied really uh, significantly on FEMA's National Risk Index, but also one of those existing work products, Metro's Multi-Hazard Mitigation Plan. And so this graph on this slide ranks our primary climate risks, both in terms of potential magnitude of impact and also in terms of how likely they are to occur. And so for Nashville, from a climate perspective, we see greater intensity of rainfall and warming temperatures as the biggest threats um, to our community. Um, and together they also work to create more storms. And so again, um, those are where um, really a lot of attention is focused, but um, we also looked at other climate risks as well um, uh, uh, based on their probability and impact. So we used a systems perspective to understand our vulnerabilities to climate hazards and risks. And so this exercise allowed us to identify the main areas where intervention is necessary, essentially where um, high risk and potential adaptive capacity coincide. We really wanted to focus on those areas where Metro had opportunity to influence outcomes. And so the white and orange shading represent some of the areas that have emerged as the highest risk areas in our um, process. And again, um, we spent quite a bit of time um, working with our workshop participants and Metro departments, as well as external stakeholders um, to, um, to develop and vet um, these areas that were identified to be at highest risk. So the next step was to evaluate adaptive capacity. And to do this, we paired the most critical areas of vulnerability identified in the prior step with focal areas for intervention. And what this allowed us to do was cross-reference corresponding goals and adaptation strategies in the roadmap. Um, and, um, and then also, um, if you've spent time in that plan in an appendix in the plan itself. And so the list of adaptation strategies is not intended to be exhaustive or fixed, but is a potential catalog of options that could be considered to meet goals. And our fourth step is, again, really building upon um, those um, focus areas to identify and prioritize adaptation strategies. And um, as just alluded to, um, that resulted in a database of best practice adaptation strategies that address the highest levels of system vulnerabilities in Metro. Um, 
through our prioritization process, we considered a, a couple of things. Um, first, uh, what strategies will make the biggest impact? Second, what ad strategies are within Metro's control? Third, which strategies target the livelihoods and well being of Metro's frontline and vulnerable communities? Fourth, um, which strategies are achievable in the near term without requiring substantial capital infusion? And so for each strategy, we also provided a detailed description of what the strategy entails, examples from other cities that had implemented similar programs, um, and then a flexible but also defined planning horizon, um, and then metro departments that might be well suited to either lead that initiative um, or be engaged um, in that initiative. And so this is a full summary of all the strategies that are included in our climate adaptation and resilience roadmap. They're organized into four high level goals um, and then within that objectives and corresponding strategies. And so the goals um, really focus on first off equity, safety, accessibility and affordability in the face of a changing climate. Second, improving and protecting public infrastructure amidst changing climate. Third, protecting and preserving natural resources for future generations. And fourth, making climate resilience a standard operating procedure for Metro. And so again, um, this is a really robust collection of actions that is intended to serve as a starting point for this conversation on adaptation and resilience. We also endeavored to identify key performance indicators um, specific to adaptation and resilience um, as a mechanism to demonstrate that it's really important to measure our progress and hold ourselves accountable for delivering on this um, on, on our adaptation strategies and moving the needle as an enterprise um, on what resilience means to our city and as Metro government as an organization. Um, and so we will also see that as we move through um, some of the specific goals, um, each individual goal could in and of itself have its own separate KPI, but this was our effort to identify um, KPIs that could be measured across the enterprise and be good indicators of progress in this regard. So a little bit on um, monitoring and evaluation of the plan is also included um, in um, the draft document. Um, and really monitoring and evaluation is delegated um, primarily to two bodies, one that um, is internal to Metro government and one that is external to Metro government. So the first is our climate working group, um, which is um, a restart and kind of reimagining of our the sustainability and resilience roundtable that's been meeting for a little over two years now on a quarterly basis. And that group draws subject matter experts from a variety of different Metro departments who do work that touches climate sustainability and resilience uh, for quarterly meetings that focus on um, shared priorities, projects, um, and um, just general exchange of information. The second is our sustainability advisory committee. And this group for the past two, two four years has actually been um, a 60 plus uh, member group um, that has served in an advisory capacity um, to help inform uh, Metro government's actions um, on environment sustainability and resilience. Um, at the end of last uh, Metro Council session, this ad hoc group was actually formalized and established in statute um, through ordinance, and it will now be a 15 member committee with appointments um, that will, um, again, meet on a quarterly basis. Those meetings will be open to the public, but it is going to be um, a much more um, a much more refined group. Um, and so the, um, the work of monitoring and evaluating this plan will be done through those two groups um, in partnerships with uh, departments that are owning those individual action steps. So the final step of the climate adaptation planning process is to develop tools to support implementation. And the primary tool at this point is going to be our climate resiliency toolkit that will be deployed to Metro departments. So a quick highlight of um, the contents include primers on topics germane to adaptation and resiliency, uh, key pieces of the adaptation plan that we wanna make sure departments are familiar with, those specific adaptation strategies and that menu of options that can be used um, to further resiliency throughout the community. Um, 
a variety of templates as well as example resources that can be used by departments as they move through um, their individual department level resilience planning process. Um, I do want to note that we've already seen several of our departments really step up um, and take leadership roles in terms of developing those templates or test out those templates. So two examples that I'll note today, um, our general services department is developing a um, hazard vulnerability assessment uh, template for facilities and our water services department is uh, designing a triple bottom line analysis tool. And so um, this is going to be an evolving work product. And as we see the needs of our departments change, we'll um, add on to that, um, that toolkit over time. And so this is an overview of the action items the working group um, agreed to um, for the early focus of the toolkit. So think about this as an added layer of detail um, that further refines the goals of the toolkit. Um, and again, we've organized them into four high level goals and within that objectives and corresponding strategies. Um, those four focus areas for this toolkit is um, internal collaborations and internal communications and collaboration, focusing on external communications, um, data tools and resources, and then training and readiness. Um, so again, really trying to complement um, the full plan and roadmap and adaptation approach with um, some resources here internally that departments can use to actually implement that work. So that concludes our prepared slides um, for this portion. Um, I'm going to go on ahead and stop sharing my screen and we can transition to the Q&A portion. See a question from DDI. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I have some a general question and some specifics. I'll just ask my general question first, just to get oriented. And I might have misunderstood something either that you said or something that I read previously. Um, is the is the um, Nashville Climate Adaption and Resilience Plan? Is that part of uh, what came from the IRA grant, the Inflation Reduction Act grants that were granted to Nashville and the state and a couple of other towns to do uh, a preliminary climate action plan are these, but it sounds like this actually predated that. Yeah, this work um, did predate that. Um, a couple of things to note. So the climate action plans that come through the BIL, I think what the program you're talking about is the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant Program that provides planning grants to large MSAs um, to uh, develop greenhouse gas emission inventories and then preliminary climate action plans. Um, this is separate. Um, the main distinction between those two things is this focuses on climate adaptation. So adjusting to the impacts of climate that we already see today. Um, the core focus, the primary focus of the climate action plans under the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant Program is climate mitigation, so reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So, um, so this is separate. I'm not gonna say it's completely unrelated. Um, the reason being that we do sometimes see, see overlap between um, climate mitigation and climate resilience actions, and obviously doing both of them presents a complete picture for what a city needs to be doing to address climate and a changing climate. Um, the other thing I'll note that relates to your question is we do as a city already have a climate action plan that focuses on greenhouse gas emissions that was completed in 2021. And so that document is still um, a living document that we very much use to guide um, our, our climate work. Is that helpful? It is. It, okay. it is. Thank you so much. I mean, so the document that I have in my hand called Nashville, Metro Nashville Climate Adapt Adaptation and Resilience Plan, September 2023, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's the current version of what you're talking about. Is that correct? It is the current and only version of our climate adaptation plan. Okay. Um, again, there's a second plan that exists that was developed in 2021 that focuses on reducing greenhouse gas emissions and the content of that more closely aligns with the funding um, in the BIL and IRA that you're referring to. 
see. Thank you very much. But there is a lot of um, funding within BIL and IRA for resiliency too. So, um, so, so it's it, it's all it's all related. I don't want to pretend that they're not related, but um, but slightly different focus for this document. Great. Thank you. Uh huh. All right. I think we've got. I just put a couple questions in the oh. Q and A, so feel free to answer oh, any or none because I also submitted these on the Google form. Okay. Let me see if I can figure out how to get to our Q and A. Okay. <laughs> this is this is my first time actually being a um, a a host um, with Q and A. So let me see if I can find them. I saw them come across the screen, but I just have to figure out there they are. I think I found them. Okay. So, um, all right, a couple of questions. So I'm going to just go in the order they were received. So first um, question is from Daria. Can you speak to the ideas that were identified, but too expensive or too complex outside of just Metro's control mm -hmm. and who in the state will pursue these? Um, so, um, I don't know that we actually identified or excluded anything outright that was too expensive or too complex. We, what we may have done was just given it a very, very long runtime or implementation time period so that we would have the opportunity to um, really thoroughly identify um, funding sources um, or responsible um, roles. Um, so, so I, I, I don't, and, and Chris, please jump in here, but I don't recall us excluding any kind of specific strategy. Um, it might just be variations of strategies and sort of um, how you choose to deploy those. Um, we do note um, there is a need for regional collaboration um, and intergovernmental collaboration as it relates to a lot of different infrastructure systems and issues, right? So climate change doesn't necessarily recognize city and, and county boundaries. And so I, I think we acknowledge that um, certain actions um, might require intense um, collaboration. Um, an example of a category that will probably be more challenging, arguably not completely out of our control, but could um, evoke an opportunity to collaborate with the state would be optimization of code zoning ordinances and design standards. So that is something that we control locally, but um, but state preemption um, could be something um, um, or a collaboration with the state to make sure they understand why we're pursuing certain updates um, is, is an example of, of something that I think would re require robust engagement. Chris, do you, do you wanna add anything to that? Were, were there specific strategies in developing this that um, that that pointed out that stood out to you? Not strategies. I, I agree with what you said. Um, I think the main way that the resource and time constraint um, influenced the development of this plan was just that we decided to focus in on the top five hazards as we describe in the plan. We did not. Um, do an all hazards risk assessment, which is what should be done um, for a city's vulnerability assessment. So we focused on the top five. We focused in on things that could be done um, by scaling up existing programs and initiatives largely that didn't require a large infusion of cash. Um, and we put off until later iterations of the plan, the all hazards assessment that would include looking at um, seismic risks and things like that. Um, as well as um, more detailed audits that should be conducted by individual departments where they go and, and assess the, the vulnerability of specific facilities against um, specific planning thresholds. So that's the only thing that I would add there. All right, so the next question um, is from Jennifer, and this is what would be your top three to five priorities for each? Um, one is the city of Nashville, two is the private sector, and three is the nonprofit sector. Um, so, so, Jennifer, I think that's a really, really good question, and I think we'll have um, more um, strategic dialogue with partners as we move through implementation. One thing to notice about this particular roadmap was we intentionally focused on things that Metro could control. And so both Chris and I acknowledge that um, additional work needs to be done to 
look at activities that are outside of Metro's direct influence and control. Um, and, and we hope that that's a future phase of work that can come out of this. Um, so something, a concept that Chris and I have discussed um, is what would it look like if we had neighborhood scale or district level resilience planning that was owned by communities? Um, and so I think that's a really interesting concept. It was not within um, our ability given the timeline and resources that we had to do that. Um, but, but I think we acknowledge that the vast majority of items in the um, roadmap are intended to be led by Metro and owned by Metro. Um, so I, I say that to say that I, I think it's hard to come up with priorities for the private sector and nonprofit sector, but I think we recognize that this work will be stronger um, if um, we are able to partner during implementation with both the private sector and nonprofit sector, and that um, we, we agree that there is an additional level of work that needs to be done um, um, in partnership um, with those different sectors. Um, to go back, uh, you know, I think um, Chris and I might have slightly differing opinions on priorities for the city of Nashville. Um, but I really think there are, are a couple of things. One is I think um, really trying to build the um, resiliency metrics, sustainability and resiliency metrics into our budgeting process and our financial decisions, um, I think is really, really important. One of the tools we spoke to earlier was the triple bottom line tool. And I think that will greatly enhance our ability to try to quantify and monetize um, costs and benefits of a, a variety of different actions relative to business as usual. Um, and probably the second one I would um, choose as kind of low hanging fruit that really needs to happen is um, asset management and optimization. So there's a lot of really great existing work that's happening within Metro um, to take stock of our facilities and um, and, and understand um, where they're performing well, but also are, are, is there opportunity to harden um, those, uh, those assets and infrastructure systems. So those would be two that um, I think um, really need to happen um, and should be prioritized, but also could probably happen with, um, with uh, minimal um, additional resources. Chris, do you wanna share maybe some of your, your three to five prior, top priorities for the city of Nashville? I, I absolutely agree with the two that you mentioned. I think in terms of indicators, um, I would also raise as a priority developing an um, equity focused indicators um, that would help to track um, gentrification in, in particular. That's one of the concerns that we heard from communities in conducting outreach on this plan um, and developing some way to monitor what's happening so that um, interventions can be um, introduced to help prevent displacement. Um, I, I think developing a program focused on that should be a priority as well. That's great. Okay, um, next question. Is there a next step, next plan that would show the next level of detail? For example, what budget is allocated to what resilience projects, what projects are being delegated to the private and third sectors? how community-led organizations can get funding to participate or how Metro plans to meet its adaptation and resiliency goals through this coalition. Um, so the next step um, to really, I think, build out that level of detail needs to be done at the department level. And so um, as far as we could go with this work was, again, um, really identifying, um, um, again, which departments are best suited to lead um, various efforts, and then the expectation um, and, and sort of the next stage is getting them to develop plans um, to implement that work, but also even beyond that, um, we'd essentially like them to develop their own department level um, resilience and climate adaptation plans. And so, unfortunately, we don't have that um, level of detail, um, but that is the logical next step. Um, and, and I like your idea of making sure that we're clearly identifying um, where partnership opportunities um, lie to help with that work. So, um, so it's a, it's a it's great question. If it's with the departments, are they incentivized to spend time and basically money on this? Um, 
I would not say um, incentivized at this stage, and, and that's part of why I answered um, the way I did in terms of how we need to prioritize this work. So I think um, one thing we have successfully been able to do with the in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space is um, begin getting departments used to the process of regularly thinking about how they're progressing their efforts in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the way they've done that is through um, basically um, kind of a self audit that is baked into the operating budget process. And so what we'd like to do is once um, some somewhat universal or representative metrics are developed, um, be able to rely on those to help inform um, investment decisions and fin financial decisions. And so I think in doing that, that will be a way of incentivizing departments um, to, um, to really follow through on this work. Hmm. It's an interesting tie in with the DEI goals that they have. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And they've, they've done really, really great work. It's their 3, now, three years now into the process and each year they've added, um, you know, refinements to the process. And, um, I think now we're seeing departments. Again, kind of self identify opportunities for improvement as opposed to it being solely. Um, you know, uh, 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 we have to do this as part of the process. Mm. So, all right, let's see. I think, okay, uh, next question is, um, yes, is there a plan or desire to help those displaced by climate migration, both those moving to Nashville and those having to move within Nashville due to living in vulnerable neighborhoods? Um, I am not aware of a global plan that does this for Nashville, but we very clearly indicate within the roadmap that um, that needs to um, be part of the conversation and we need to have um, approaches in place that um, prevent displacement, um, either that occurs in the process of trying to um, take people out of harm's way or um, due to the concept of green gentrification. So as we um, sort of make spaces more resilient, is that unintentionally um, increasing property value and making it inaccessible to certain populations. And so we acknowledge that, um, but, but there does need to, that would be a next step and a recommendation from this is to, to develop um, such plans and efforts. So yes, desire um, plan um, not currently in place, but but we know we need to do more work in that that um, arena. Okay. Um, there is a question about what role protection of the Highland Rim forest can play in resiliency and adaptation to climate change. So um, there is broad recognition across Metro that. Um, tree canopy is really important um, and um, and um, has a lot of benefits, um, both from a climate mitigation, um, but also adaptation perspective, particularly when we look at flooding and stormwater capture, but also extreme heat. Um, so I think there's clear recognition um, from a metro perspective that that um, we do need to to make sure we're restoring tree canopy. Um, you know, I think one of the challenges, and, and this is something we will continue to address as we move through the roadmap process, um, is, um, you know, where we do have limited funding to um, pursue a variety of different resiliency strategies, where are we putting that funding? Um, and so I, I, I don't know that we've had enough conversations to say that um, Highland Rim is, is something that absolutely um, is is um, going to be uh, um, funded by Metro to support resiliency and adaptation, but there is agreement on, on again, that trees are an important part of the solution. And so, um, so, so more conversations need to be had again about Highland Rim specific role and Metro's capacity to um, engage there. Um, I also think there's an interesting dialogue that we'll see play out as to what protection looks like and how you protect it, right? Um, so I think there are a couple of different tools in the toolbox that could be used to protect 
um, natural resources. And we talk about that um, in, um, in the roadmap um, in that uh, third third goal area that sets out to protect and preserve nature for future generations. And so I think there is alignment between um, natural resource preservation and that goal, um, but how you go about doing that um, is, is an area where more conversation needs to happen. Okay, I think that gets to all the ones in the Q&A. Let me go back up to the chat. Um, a lot of focus on grid resiliency. So one thing I will note is that um, we did not have the opportunity to engage with NES um, as part of this planning process, but it is a safe assumption to say that the vast majority of recommendations that talk about infrastructure and resilience from an infrastructure perspective also have broad applicability to them. Um, once we do finalize this document, we will be sharing this with them. Um, TVA actually participated in um, this morning's um, planning session or discussion session, and so they're taking an interest in this work. Um, but but definitely agree that um, electricity and energy grid resiliency um, is is an important piece of that. But also want to acknowledge that we didn't have the opportunity to collaborate. Caroline. I see your hand up. Hey, Kendra. Hey. Uh, I am wondering, related to the Highland Rim, can you discuss why landslides was not included in this plan? So, um, Chris, I'm going to actually let you directly address that one um, because I think you will more accurately represent um, represent the the thought process in your review of of the plans sure we as i was saying before we had um limited time and resources to get this plan put together within um this calendar year so we did choose to focus on the the hazards that fell at the highest um impact and probability range in that um chart that kendra was showing earlier landslides are judged to be a uh, moderate impact and probability by FEMA and in Nashville's multi hazard mitigation plan. So they were landslides did not fall into that um, highest risk area. That doesn't mean that they aren't important to look at. Um, and actually, this is an old, old chart. We downgraded, or there they are, that hail was also downgraded to moderate. Um, in future iterations of an adaptation plan, we would like to include all of the hazards that are shown here, just we we had to prioritize the most likely ones um, for this particular plan. Um, if I could go ahead and follow up. Um, can you talk a little bit about how FEMA determined which risk was highest? Yes, we use their national risk index tool um, and I'm not going to do a great job of explaining how it, it's um, it's developed because it's uh, let me just pull up the um, the appendix one in our plan actually explains how they come about their ratings, but they basically the index is is based on um, a calculation of the expected annual loss, um, so they look at um, Probability, which is um, based on how often such events have occurred in the past, and then they look at estimated annual loss values of what the cost would be due to damaged infrastructure, damaged crops, and um, lives disrupted or lost, and they assign a value to that as well. Um, those are multiplied by a factor of social vulnerability for the city, which is taken from uh, CDC's social vulnerability index. And then um, the values are divided by a community resilience value for the community. So that's how the, the total risk index value is derived by FEMA. Um, there's a lot of detail that they provide on their website on how they calculate those values that I'm not going to be able to do justice to um, without a bit more preparation, um, but the appendix one in the plan does provide some 
background information on how the risk scores are calculated. And I, I'll share just as additional context to that. Um, there are many, many tools out there that um, attempt to quantify risk to climate risks based on geographic location. One thing that we saw as very important is we did not want to put um, conflicting information out in front of the public about how we're evaluating risk. And so knowing that FEMA um, TEMA, um, and then also our Office of Emergency Management use um, pretty consistently the same set of information to inform their planning efforts and ranking um, climate risks. Um, we did not want to conflict with those processes to, to confuse the public. Um, and so um, wanted to make sure that um, our work was embraced um, and, and that um, stakeholders from the emergency um, preparedness and response um, discipline um, saw alignment with their work. Paul, I think you had your hand up, maybe. I, I don't know if, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. <laughs> no, I was one who asked, I, I didn't have my hand up. I asked the question about the Highland Rim. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not used to this platform at all, so I'm not sure what yeah. I'm communicating, but yeah. anyway, no, yeah. that was my question. And and I think actually, Carolyn, I'm glad you brought up landslides because also uh, something that comes up in context when talking about Highland Rim is steep slopes that um, are, are part of the Highland Rim. And so, um, again, I think there's there's recognition that there are um, air properties that should not be um, developed on because they present significant risk, including slopes and hillsides. And so, um, as I mentioned before, um, I think there are a variety of tools that Metro um, could explore to preserve currently undeveloped um, spaces um but 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 those are very active conversations um and and without definitive answers right now caroline yeah um well related to that can you talk about how <clears throat> the development community might present a challenge for implementing some of this plan um, I, I see the development community as a very important stakeholder in this process. Um, I think the actions that they take um, can really further resilience. And so I think um, one of the important conversations to have with them is, I think, quantifying um, the impacts associated with investment and in resilience versus um, business as usual and failure to act. And so um, as 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 devastating as it's been for many of us to see 2022, 2023, um, and a variety of extreme weather events impact our community. Um, I think the upside of those events is that it is waking up um, stakeholders of all types to the reality of climate change. And so um, while, while I, I, I will not be naive to say that um, it, it's unlikely that we would see opposition um, to certain measures. I'm, I'm hopeful that, again, we can have robust engagement and discussion about why this is important um, for our city and our community to, to, again, be good stewards of our population and um, do everything we can to protect, um, protect our residents. I guess along those lines, what do you see as the biggest challenges to moving this forward? I um, think financial and financial resources and manpower. Um, there is no doubt in my mind that that Metro is is committed to becoming um, and the city is committed to um, addressing um, climate work and adapting to a changing climate. Um, but as with um, any reality, um, we have limited resources, um, both financial and um, human resources. And so I think um, finding um, capacity to implement this work um, is going to be a challenge. Um, I don't think it's insurmountable. Um, 
you know, we were talking about federal funding before. There's a variety of different grant opportunities, um, whether those be formula grants or competitive grants um, that we can um, access. We're actively reaching out, trying to pull down those grant dollars. And so I think that in combination with um, being more strategic and intentional about public private partnerships, um, there's real opportunity to get this work done. But um, that's not necessarily a process. Um, leveraging partnerships and grant funds that we're um, great at right now. And so I think it will take time for us to um, to, to develop that capacity and, and make that part of business as usual. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you all saw, but the White House did just put out a national climate resilience framework. They did, and it aligns very nicely with a lot of the things that yeah. are in here. So, yeah, um, yes, so that was, I was really excited to see that. Yeah. Yeah, this has been a, a really thorough, like, well thought out plan. Really impressive. Thank you. As, as mentioned, um, Kristen did um, the vast majority of the heavy lifting. And so I'm incredibly grateful um, for her work and dedication to this topic. But also the departments who, um, who, who helped us pull this together. have a quick question do you have ways for those of us who are constituents to become more involved um in this process yeah um so um first thing obviously is share comments with us um written comments but you're already becoming an active participant by dedicating your wednesday evening um to learn more about this and give us your feedback so that's number one um as noted earlier there's a real interest in recognition that this work needs to go beyond Metro. We just found that as kind of the first logical starting point um, from a lead by example perspective, but then also influencing what is within our direct control. And so beyond that, um, there um, are resources that we're hoping to develop um, for individual constituents um, or groups um, uh, um, uh, or community-based organizations. Um, an example of one of those is um, there is um, uh, community emergency response training that the Office of Emergency Management currently offers. Um, not exactly the same thing as adaptation or resilience training, but um, I think a good um, primer um, into understanding um, some of the concepts that um, are germane um, to resilience. Um, we're hoping to develop a light module of that um, that is um, um, slightly less time intensive um, and perhaps better suited um, for, for members of the general public. Um, and so something we are thinking about is, again, how do we start creating resources and um, um, uh, DIY materials that um, individuals can um, use in their own daily lives? I'll give an example of something we've done um, in the sustainability and climate mitigation realm. Um, our sustainability advisory committee actually developed um, a, a family sustainability audit um, and checklist. And so um, something we could consider um, as part of implementation in the future is creating something similar for the resilience space. And um, um, ready.gov already has some resources out there um, for individuals as well as businesses. So. I think um, engaging in that kind of self-learning um, is really critical because the more primed our um, public is um, for understanding the topic, um, that um, sort of helps helps us actually move through the implementation phase if there's a good understanding as to why we're doing it. But I think we have um, we're we're all ears as well as to whether or not um, or, or as, as to what specific ideas you all might have that would particularly resonate um, with the community. I would add also that once the um, new sustainability advisory committee or council is formed and starts meeting quarterly, those meetings will be open to the public. So mm -hmm. um, that would be an opportunity to get information on updates to this plan and to the, its implementation um, and any new initiatives that might be created. We all started so, to receive indications from Freddie's administration of like how much commitment he wants to put into this. Is it the same as before? More? Don't know. Uh, yeah, it, it, um, I, I think it's um, 
I, I think um, there is a lot of support um, with this administration and climate adaptation and resilience work and a deep desire to do everything we possibly can to pull down federal funding for this work. Great. Other questions? Um, I will um, put our emails in the chat, and so that way you all can feel free to um, to email us um, if you have questions that you think of um, in the middle of the night um, after our meeting today. Um, but also feel free to um, share feedback via the Google form um, that's posted um, with the plan as well. So. And please help get the word out um, to your networks as well. We, you know, this this plan will be better the more input and feedback we get. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Have a good evening. You all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>